Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome out to our community conversation, our live community conversation on education, on equity, and access. And we can give our panelists a round of applause for making the way out as Aurora celebrates Black History Month. We call this month Aurora in Black. It's the time for us as we focus on excellence and we focus on empowerment to take the 28 days as an anniversary, because of course we celebrate all year long, but certainly as an anniversary to put a spotlight on some of the amazing things that are happening here in this city, including today's conversation, again, on education, equity, and excellence. I haven't met you yet, Clayton Muhammad, the Chief Equity Officer and Communications Officer here at the City of Aurora, and so honored to have our distinguished guest here with us. There are a number of distinguished members of the audience who are here with us as well. Let me introduce you to a number of our elected official members of the city council here. Our alderman at large, Sherman Jenkins, is with us. Thank you so much, <laughs> Alderman Jenkins. Our alderman of the fourth ward, Bill Donnell, is here with us as well. Thank you so much, Alderman. And our alder woman, please give a round of applause, alder woman of the tenth ward, alder woman, Shweta Bay, is here. Thank you so much. We're also joined today by our Deputy Mayor, Deputy Mayor Guillermo Trujillo. Thanks so much for all of you that you do for us, Deputy Mayor. And of course, by our 59th Mayor of Aurora, the history maker that he is, Mayor Richard C. Irvin. We are joined by this distinguished panel, a number of friends and, and family who consider each other here in the city of Aurora who helped to move this city forward. First, we're joined by our assistant principal of West Aurora High School, representing Dr. Jeff Craig. Round of applause for Dr. Whitney Martino. And right around, he is the president of the College of DuPage, Dr. Brian Caputo. He's the superintendent of East Aurora School District 131, Dr. Jennifer Norell. The president of Wabonzi Community College just celebrated her 20th year, Dr. Christine Soga. And the superintendent of Indian Prairie School District 204, Dr. Adrian Tapp. And making her way from the south side of Chicago, please give a big round of applause. We'll give a little more in-depth introduction in just a bit. But the president of Chicago State University, Z. Scott Eckler. and the team. And ladies and gentlemen, to open us up officially, another round of applause to the Honorable Mayor, Richard C. Irvin. Well, good afternoon, and welcome to City Hall as we continue our celebration of Black History Month. Thank you to those who are here in person and those watching online. It is very appropriate that we host today's conversation on Valentine's Day, because one common focus we can all love is our children and their futures. So today, we are here to discuss their education in general and how we are making sure they have equitable access to the opportunities that will make a difference in their lives and beyond high school. Uh, the distinguished educators who join me today certainly have been doing this work for years. Thank you to our local superintendents, Dr. Uh, Jennifer uh, Norell, my alma mater, East Aurora School District 131. I, I, I always got you know, to give a shout out. A little, a little black and red in the house. I don't mean to disrespect anybody else around the table. <laughs> uh, Dr. Adrian Vitale uh, of the Indian Prairie School District 204 and uh, representing Dr. Craig, the superintendent of uh, West Aurora School Districts uh, and the chair of the Aurora Education Commission is Dr. Uh, Whitney Martino, the assistant principal of West Aurora High School. Uh, thank you to our vice chair of the Aurora Education Commission and the president of Wabansi uh, Community College, Dr. Christine Sobeck, and the president of College of DuPage and former chief of staff uh, for the city of Aurora, Dr. Brian Caputo. Good to see you again, Brian. Uh, it's our honor to have worked with you for many years and a, and a special thanks to my dear friend who I met a couple of years ago when I visited her in Chicago for an event that, that shined a fantastic, fantastic spotlight on the transformation, transformative work she is doing at Chicago State University, the president of uh, CSU, C. Scott. When we arranged a, uh, a follow-up meeting with the two of us, I saw an excellent opportunity to expand the conversation and talk with our rural education leaders about this critical topic of equity and access to education opportunities. And that is why we are here today. You know, I'm a proud graduate of East Aurora High School. Still, as I've shared many times, I wasn't the best and most committed student. You know, as a matter of fact, I'll tell a story. I had to beg my 
Spanish teacher for a D instead of an F, so I could walk with my classmates. He gave me a D minus, so well, that was enough to get me across the line. You know, but, but I, I recognize, as I got out of the military, the access to post-secondary education opportunities uh, is, is important, but it wasn't part of my conversation in, in high school. You know, but through the GI Bill, I attended Robert Morris University. And at Robert Morris, I met educators who empowered me and provided me information and, and inspiration that, that I needed to continue my education and obtain my bachelor's degree and Juris Doctorate degree. Uh, thank, thankfully, today, we have an education community focused on equity and access for all with specific opportunities for some of our most underrepresented populations, like our back, black students and all of our minority students and all the people of color. Normally, we have done these community conversations virtually. So today also makes history as our first live community conversation uh, since COVID. And I couldn't think of a more relevant topic to discuss as we cel celebrate Black History Month. So uh, let's go ahead and begin this. Mr. Muhammad, you want to kick us off? Definitely. Everybody, when you speak, if you can just please hit that center button, turn your microphone on. As we begin the conversation with our guest speaker, uh, the president of Chicago State University, unanimously elected by the Board of Trustees to serve as the 12th permanent president of Chicago State, assuming the role on July 1st, 2018. She oversaw the development and the advancement of the CSU strategic plan from 2020 to 2005, that strategic plan, ensuring that her institution will lead with the mission of transformation for student lives through innovation and excellence with ethical leadership. Prior to her current role, she was an equity partner in a national law firm with an international practice that focused on corporate internal investigations, counseling clients on regulatory compliance and crisis management as well. She has taught at some of the nation's most competitive law schools, including Northwestern University School of Law, the University of Chicago Law School, and the UIC John Marshall Law School as well. Dr. Scott is a well-known advocate for equity in higher education, having formed and co-chaired the Equity Working Group, a body of leaders from across the education, public, private, philanthropic, and community development sectors to formulate an action plan for addressing black student access and success in Illinois higher education. Ladies and gentlemen, another round of applause for the president of Chicago State University, Z. Scott Esquire. Well, thank you so much for the uh, kind welcome and introduction. I, I feel like I need to tape record that and uh, take it back to with me on to South Side of Chicago. First of all, thank you so much, Mayor, for inviting me this afternoon. Uh, you know, we are we are in the middle of a, a whirlwind of events on our campus involving Black History Month, and it, and I, I appreciate the opportunity to leave campus and take our show on the road, because I indeed have a, a great story to tell you. Some of the some of the things that we're going to talk about this afternoon tell you some of the, tell you some of the challenges our students are facing inside of higher education in Illinois, but I'm also here to bring you good news and how we as an institution are beginning to tackle some of those challenges and hopefully we will see results, particularly for our black students and our black families. Many of you know about Chicago State, but how many of you really know about Chicago State? Know who we are, what we are, what we're doing, what we've been up to the last four years. Chicago State is Illinois, one of Illinois' only, uh, first of all, oldest public universities. We were founded 10 years after Aurora in 1867, uh, and we've been around for a long time. We are Illinois' only four-year United States Department of Education designated predominantly black institution. And I'll talk a little bit about what it means to be a PBI. We're a member of the Thurgood Marshall College Fund. That means Chicago State shares the same room with 47 other historically black colleges and universities in the country. We, we are very important to the higher ed ecosystem of Illinois. One in 10 black graduates in the state got that degree from Chicago State. Uh, we are on the far south side of Chicago, but our reach is far wide broader than that, given the work of our professors and research and where our students uh, it, uh, leave and go in terms of uh, leaving with their degrees. Our economic impact on this state is, in, is strong. It's calculated to be about $1.6 per year, and we are uh, annually supporting about 17,000 jobs. Uh, our faculty also identifies as incredibly diverse. So you would imagine what it's like to go to work every day and to see 
uh, so many people with advanced and PhD degrees who look like me is an, indeed an experience that many of our students never had prior to coming to Chicago State. We're also incredibly uh, well known for our economic mobility. We're in the top 4% of all colleges and universities in, in this country in terms of economic mobility. So that means when our students leave with that degree, they are destined to go above uh, a certain level in, uh, in the income ladder. So we make a difference. Now what does it mean to be a PBI? Uh, back in 2008, uh, uh, then Senator Barack Obama and in the, in the House, uh, Representative Danny Davis started working on legislation to bring recognition to a category of institutions, colleges and universities who were, pro who were supporting uh, black uh, students in higher education. Ultimately, the legislation passed in the Senate and it became uh, known as the Higher Education Act. And inside of that act, recognition was given to PBIs. Now, in order to be a PBI, you have to serve at least 1,000 undergraduate students. And you have to have, your students have to be low resource, meaning either 50% of them are low, below the poverty line, or first generation degree seeking. Meaning it's going to be difficult for students in that category to get a degree. And your institution itself has to have a low per pupil uh, in terms of your, your ability to spend money on educating those students, meaning that you might need more assistance from the federal government in your education process. And you have to enroll at least 40% African American students. So again, Chicago State is the only four-year PBI in the Midwest. Our student profile is indeed unique. We're 84% Latinx and black. 48% of our students identify as first-generation degree-seeking. 30% of our undergraduate students have at least one dependent, making child care an important element of what we do every day as a campus. And 90% of 6% of our students are Pell Grant eligible. Most presidents in this country, when they hear that Pell Grant eligibility statistic, they about fall out of their chairs because they know that when you have students who are at this level, or who are at, perhaps have this present with this level of poverty, that a college education will be more difficult because of the challenges and obstacles along the way. And 35% of our students come to us as first freshmen. So the majority of our students come to Chicago State's transfer system. Students. So 65% of our student population are transfer students. When I came to Chicago State, I, I uh, talked with my provost and said, look, we have to be very focused and very intentional about our student success strategy. And out of that task force and visits to other colleges and universities across the country, we, we, we've got together what we call our Cougar commitment. And it is along that t entire experience line a student might have with Chicago State, starting with high school. High school students who are looking for an opportunity to engage with a, with a college institution like Chicago State. We have what we call a dual enrollment program and it's intentional and it's intended to encourage college going behavior among minority students. And I was talking to, to your mayor today, I said, look, Chicago State is offering college level coursework to high school students, typically in their junior and senior year, for free. Free. And that means, and the college courses are not just on our campus, although we would prefer students to be on our campus. Many students, like students in Aurora, don't have immediate access to Chicago State. These students can take the courses online at Chicago State for free and walk away with college credit. Because the data shows that a student who has a college level experience while in high school is more likely to go to college and complete the degree. Mm -hmm. And the students who are least likely to have a college going experience while in high school are black students. Least likely. So that, that is why it's important for us to encourage our students to, to go to our community colleges or enroll in, in, in a college level coursework at our public universities to have the experience of experiencing college. We've also done other things that, that are designed to encourage greater retention and access. We have, you know, we're test optional admissions. Uh, we have a transway, transfer pathway for our community college students. 
And we, are, we have eliminated a development on education. We have a pre-college bridge program called the RISE Academy where our students come to us in the summer and they spend five weeks with us, not just on having taken a college course, but also on learning leadership, financial literacy, and why am I going to college to develop a sense of belonging before the actual experience starts. And our data already shows us that that pre-college experience is yielding better retention for our college students. There are a number of other things that we're doing to encourage retention, but we also are focused on graduation. What happens after you get that degree? Because data also shows that black students and Latinx students who exit with a degree from college will earn less money. So we have become more intentional about our internships and our placement of our students post-graduation. We want our students to go into companies that are prepared to receive them. Not just of saying, here are five jobs that we have opening open. We have want, here are five jobs for Chicago State students that we will know that we, where they will be successful and we will take care of them along their journey through our company or corporation. So I talked a little bit about our, um, our dual enrollment program. But I want to emphasize how successful our students have been in dual enrollment. We have a 97% pass rate of college of high school students in our program. And students who went, to, uh, went through the program in 19 and 20 uh, earned a B or better in the coursework. Amazing results for students who are coming to college cold. And we are offering a variety of different courses for our students. And we're, we will be piloting a different kind of program in the fall. I want to just spend a few minutes on our RISE Academy. We talked about it. RISE, RISE, RISE. I mean, the reason why we call it that, because it's free freshman year. Free. No tuition. No fees. No books. It's all paid for. And so a student can come into a freshman year and just focus on, I'm in college. Free laptops. Hot spots for internet access if you're challenged when it comes to having access to any internet, which many of our students are. So every part of the experience is designed in order for our students to be successful. We encourage our students to also go to summer school and uh, take and, and really eliminate some of the burden of just two semesters of coursework by taking a course in the summer. And we pay for it. And, we are, and some of our students are even now receiving a stipend to further support uh, their attendance in college. We also, uh, we talk, I've talked to your community college presidents. They've met, we've met. Uh, we did the, uh, you know, everyone knows that I am a walking road show. So <laughs> I am always out here promoting Chicago State. Not because, because I think people should know what we're offering and what, our, what is available for students there. And we have a, tr a complete transfer scholarship matrix for students who are coming from our community colleges who are interested in coming to Chicago State. We're also very interested in looking at what's happening inside of our classrooms. We started as a teacher's college. And so what we now know is that um, our teach our, many of our students are not seeing teachers that look like them when they go into the classrooms, K-12. through Students are graduating from K-12 through institutions never seeing, never seeing a Latinx or a black teacher in any of their classrooms. And Chicago State is doing what we can to improve not only the number of teachers in our classroom, but the diversity of teachers in our classroom. We have two programs going on right now. One's called Call Me Mister, which encourages black and Latinx males to enter into the field of education. Free tuition, four years, and mentoring and other experiences to encourage completion. We have another program called Diverse Scholars in Education, again, offering uh, our students free tuition uh, to move through a curriculum uh, in, o in order to get them out here as teachers. But we all have, so have a lot going on on our campus. People don't know how much time the president spends on athletics. <laughs> Chicago State <laughs> University is a D1 athletics program. We have 15 different teams. They're all, and it's year-round, all kinds of things. Uh, we're a member of the Western Athletic Conference right now, but we're on the hunt for a new conference affiliation. But, that, but I spend a lot of time on sports, and not only on sports, but attending sports games. Um, 
we have a number of student uh, organizations. We, have a, we now have a marching band called the Marching Soul of Chicago, where scholarships are available. We have offices that support our students with disabilities. We have an African American, American Male Resource Center, a Career Development Center, counseling, mental health services are available, LGBTQI, Q plus Resource Center on our campus, full Greek life uh, for, our, for our, my sororers in the audience, uh, and an ROTC program. We have an amazing uh, program with the U.S. Coast Guard where our students can enter the Coast Guard in their junior year and they earn a full salary while they're completing their education and receive scholarship supports from the Coast Guard. Amazing program. You probably don't even know that there's a course Coast Guard installation uh, in Chicago that supports the, the Great Lakes region. And we also have a student government association. We have many of our, our partners that have become very committed uh, to Chicago State. We're running a presidential lecture series right now, but these are just a few of our partners. And Discover has donated to my presidential lecture series, just an example, $10,000 to the lecture series that will be used to support graduate student scholarships. Our corporate partners are doing different things differently with Chicago State, and just a few who are doing something different. For example, uh, Spark Foundry is part of the Publicist suite of companies. They are, their executives are on campus right now teaching a course to our students through which they are trying to identify students who are interested in media, mm -hmm. students who are interested in a summer internship in, in, in media. And through that relationship, these students will get internships and full-time jobs. Last year, they hired two students into one of the publicist companies called Libra. Many of you are familiar with Leo Burnett. That's also part of publicists like Spark. But students are getting, on to getting that in the classroom experience that will lead to a full-time job. And that's the kind of a new way of looking at how to support students as they transition uh, to co uh, from college into career. Uh, uh, you mentioned in, in, opening your, in my, your opening statement about me is that we started looking at what was happening to our black students, particularly after George Floyd, and how they were experiencing higher ed, the higher ed <coughs> ecosystem. And one of the things that that exploration led to was uh, we were visited by uh, the U.S. Secretary of Education this, this, this uh, academic year. He came out to talk to us about our status as a PBI and how our students were having, what experience our students was, were having at Chicago State as the only PBI, four-year PBI in the, in the Midwest. Think about this. Um, Secretary Cardona along with the Surgeon General, sat down with our students to talk about what it's like going to college during the pandemic, what their experiences had been. And he said to our students, what you're talking about and experiences you're having really focus on black excellence. Because that's what our students were able to describe uh, to the Secretary of Education. Now, for me, I'm like, what well, was the last time the Secretary of Education was on our campus? The answer is never. And the, question, and the answer is, what are we doing that's attracting that kind of national attention to our advocacy? And I could be no more, more proud of our, our university. We talked a little, you talked a little bit in your opening about the equity working group or, um, to look at black student access and success. Here's what the data says. The rate at which black students are going to college in Illinois has dropped 34% from 2013 to 2019. We haven't even looked at the, da the data from the pandemic. This is a crisis in Illinois. Mm -hmm. It is a crisis. And not only is it a crisis for black the community, it's also a, cri a crisis for all communities. Because all votes have to ride together in this state in order for us to be successful as a state. And I know you agree with that, Mayor. Uh, so what, we, what Chicago State did was form a working group, as you mentioned, from across the state of professionals to look at the issue together. It's not just higher ed's problem. It's all of our problems. It's philanthropy. It's their problem. It's corporate America's problem. It's the problem of our, of our uh, political officials. So we came together and we looked at this issue together for about six months and we came up with, um, with our action plan. And this looks at how our students are experiencing. These are some short graphs. 
you can take a look at later. Look at the graduation rates from our public university. The white graduation rate is 70%. The black graduation rate is 38%. Look at our community colleges. We're graduating at a, at a rate of 14.2% on average in the state. But the white graduation rate is 38%. All these statistics tell you that there is something happening in the ecosystem of higher education that is not benefiting our black students. So these are, these are some more equity gap data that you can take a look at later. But what, and here's the members of our equity working group that included Senator L.G. Sims, because it was a cross section of people, uh, Karen Freeman Wilson from the Urban League in Chicago, and John Atkinson were our co-chairs, and he's the um, chair of the board of the Illinois Board of Higher Education. So in May of 21, we released our equity action plan. Uh, we got a lot of great publicity from it. It was carried in a lot of our newspapers. But what's happening with the action plan is something that I will, I will close out with. The plug, we will be standing up on our campus, the Illinois Center for Education Equity. And the center will look at policy rec and look at and make policy recommendations for all of Illinois on how we can improve outcomes for our black students. And we will be measuring that outcome. The Center for Education and Equity will be sitting and be an active part of our uh, Institute for Solutions of Urban Populations that we have on our campus that is looking at the social determinants of health. Education is a social determinant of health. The more education that you have, the longer you will live, and the better the outcomes for you and your family. So we're, we're very focused on that uh, as part of our institute. So that is my presentation, uh, Mayor. Thank you so much for your time and your engagement. Hopefully something I've said or you've heard will prompt you to say, I need to really focus on how I can help our students in this state uh, when it comes to higher education. Big round of applause for these guys. Thank you. So many points, uh, Dr. Scott, with what you're doing and, and how we're working in Aurora to, to do so many of the similar uh, actions for our children. We're going to turn it over now to some of our education leaders before we open it up for questions. We do have a number of facilitated questions already submitted. But turn it over to our education leaders to briefly share what your district or what your college is doing to empower the next generation of leaders through equitable access and your inclusion efforts particularly for black and minority students and families. And we'll go alphabetically, beginning with Dr. Brian Caputo, president of College of Page. Are we on here? You're on. Yes. Um, let me start by thanking the mayor for organizing this event. I think it's an important event and is carrying a very uh, significant message. At College of DuPage, we wholeheartedly believe in the power of education. Um, we are focused on student success. Indeed, we call that our North Star. We're all about trying to get students where they, where they want to go. And as the largest community college in Illinois and the second, second largest purveyor of undergraduate education in Illinois, we have a very diverse population. About 45% of our student population is uh, comprised of students of color. And through very intentional efforts, we have tried to implement best practices to reach those students and indeed Ride, uh, make all the boats rise. It's not enough just to recognize that we have a diverse society, but we really need to be intentional about what we do to try to help students of color close what we call an equity gap, and I'll explain that in just a, just a, a minute. Um, President Scott and uh, Dr. Sobek are participants in a group with College of DuPage called the Illinois Equity and Attainment Initiative. And that, that really is a group of, uh, of several institutions of higher education that are dedicated to trying to close the gap between how uh, successful white students are and how successful students of colors, color are. And there is a gap um, for both black and Latinx students. And the, po the, the point is to try to close that gap by 2020. Through very intentional design, we have tried to address this equity gap. And some of the things we're doing, we developed an equity plan at College of DuPage uh, that preceded some of the tragic events of, of, uh, of last year. And what that involves in part uh, is first development of a multicultural center. That's a place where students can go to feel where they, that they belong. 
and that um, it's a place where we can uh, host programming that will reach all students, particularly those that are students of color. Also, just recently, our board approved the hiring of an equity a DEI consultant that's really is helping us understand what issues we have with our institution. We might think that we understand them, but not necessarily. So that, that consultant's going to help us do that. And what we expect to come out of that, um, that uh, engagement is for us to first take a look at our training that we have to help sensitize our student, uh, our, our faculty population, and our staff as to where are we? Uh, do you understand uh, the behaviors that make, might make students of color feel uncomfortable? What can we do to make them feel more, feel more welcome and more a part of our, our community? And also we expect that there'll probably some change, be some changes that come in our hiring practices to make sure that we have a more diverse, um, a diverse uh, college community. I will say, I'm very proud to say that my cabinet is very diverse. We have nine members, two of them are black, two of them are Latinx, the rest are white, so we're, as far as percentages goes, compared to our college community, we're doing, we're doing pretty well. But we need to press that out throughout all of our different in, employee groups. There are some other issues, uh, some other initiatives that we've got uh, going at the college that I think are, are highly relevant. What we do is we have a peer mentoring program, which tries to, to match up um, students that are first generation students and students who are first time COD students and match them up with a, a student who is more experienced in, in college life, one that has at least 20 credit hours, and to help them along and feel, feel like they're attached to the institution and to get involved in college life. Uh, also, I'll add that we have admissions reps that are trying intentionally to reach out to students of, of color and their families to integrate them into the college community with workshops and brochures that are, in some cases, um, uh, bilingual. Uh, have have a English version and a Spanish version. We we continue to find how we are reaching out to those students. We also have first generation info information sessions. Uh, we have that we have workshops that try to help students through that very difficult process of the free application for federal student aid, the FAFSA. It's uh, for some it is a very high bar to cross. We have sessions to try to help them through that so they can access some of the financial resources that are at the college um, more easily. So I think what I'll do is I'll stop there to allow my colleagues that got some time to uh, offer up what they've been doing. But I, again, Mary, I thank you very much for bringing us all here and very much look forward to continuing the collective discussion about DEI and education because there's, there's room for work. Round of applause, Dr. Brian Kapoor, PhD. <laughs> Next, Assistant Principal Westford High School, Dr. Wendy Martina. Thank you. I'm so honored to be here. Thank you, Mayor, for uh, inviting us. And President Scott, it was so exciting to hear about the work that you're doing at, uh, at Chicago State. Um, and I'm honored to be here on behalf of District 129. You know, we really think about, with our students, finding your passion. What is your passion? And then securing the opportunities to pursue it. And we know that though sometimes those opportunities have barriers, and we really look to break down those barriers. Where are they? and how do we remove them when possible or create programs or look for systems that can help support those different barriers. The, uh, the statistics that you presented earlier about gaps in access and gaps in attainment was something that we did notice as, as well in School District 129 a couple of years ago and really looking at why is that happening and where is it. Um, interestingly for us, enough for us, it starts so young when we look at um, you know, your state assessments or even you look at any type of uh, standardized assessment that we give starting in, in third grade, honestly. It was, wh how are we using those assessments? Do we use them to sort in group? Or are we using them to identify areas where we need additional programs to support students in various ways? Because if those are used to create and sort, it's hard because when you come to that high school level, and I so very much um, am proud of the work that we've done in partnership with Wabanzi Community College, our work with advanced placement and having access to those college level courses in high school. To go back to that just really quick, it is so important to, for students to have that opportunity. You know, when you think about a college student in high school, one, we often say, you know, well, I don't know if I'm a college student, and, and we'll say, you are a college student. You're in a dual credit course, you're in an AP course, you're accessing that now. In addition to that, at the high school level, we can offer and provide daily instruction with one of our teachers. We can also provide counseling support. There's additional uh, 
groups and, and support that we have here at a building so that you feel comfortable then. You've completed your freshman year of English if you're taking dual credit uh, English Comp 101, so that when you get to that college level, you have that information. You've been exposed to the rigorous instruction that is a college course, and that you feel it, and, and there is a sense or a feeling of accomplishment and success when you do, when you do uh, enter the, your freshman year of college. So going back to those identification of barriers, that was one thing we noticed. How do we stop that in third grade so that when students come to us at the high school, there's open access for all, regardless of where you began your journey here in your educational career. When we remove that, we also look at how do we support students that, and opportunities for them to have access to a college and career fair, bringing colleges into our school, meeting with admissions counselors, lunch and learns. I go back to that passion. You know, we want students to always feel, and, and I backtrack a bit, but I always think about grade 13. What does that look like for students? Do you? You graduate from West Aurora High School, and what does 13 mean to you? Um, and do you know how to change paths or find that passion or, or gain information and, and being able to go on to, to college? So those clear career and college exploration activities that we provide for students, I go back to those we lunch and learn, so we bring in community members, partnering with mentors in our community to provide that access. You brought up the free, and, uh, the free application for federal student aid. Uh, Dr. Caputo, and that was one of those where we're now a requirement at the high school level for graduation, either completing it or opting out. And that's a large lift. I look at um, the other, my colleagues here at the table, of, of, of thinking of senior classes of, of 900 kids. That's a, that's a big ask to get that done. But what we've learned is just doing that and requiring it not only requires the student to think about themselves as a college student, but to also have that conversation with their family and see that a barrier of finance, that your financial barrier is a barrier, but we can push through that, or there, is, there are additional resources or access for you, and that's so important for our students to see. You know, and finally, as we think about um, our partnership with Wabanzi Community College, our transitional courses in both English and math, and just working very hard to what, what are the experiences students are getting in that senior and junior year? Is it rigorous curriculum? Do they have the skills that they need to then be successful, not only to access college, but then also attain that degree that's so valuable? Thank you for having me. I'd be remiss if we didn't recognize also the, the retired assistant superintendent of West Aurora Schools who built such a strong foundation that the district continues to stand down. And a former Illinois State Board of Education member, Ms. Cynthia Latimer, is here as well. Thanks so much for your work. Thank you. Keep that applause going for our superintendent of East Aurora Schools, Dr. Jennifer Norell. <laughs> such a wonderful topic, so thank you again, Mayor Irving, for having this and for hosting something that is so critically important. Um, I would like to just share from East Aurora's perspective because I'd first like to say, though, that I'm so proud of our faculty and staff that although we've been through the last two years for what it was, um, it was so challenging, but they did not let their foot off the gas through all that time, and so some of the things that we've been able to do um, surrounding equity and access for our children um, have just been unbelievable and even more so in light of going through the pandemic and non-traditional ways to even communicate. Um, so we take equity and access um, like we, we feel about that like we do about breathing air in East Aurora. It is so critically important um, and we understand that and we identify with that. And so one of the things that I want to first mention, I have three buckets, but one of the first things that I think is critically important that is an advantage that we have being unit school districts out here, and that is we be, are able to begin with the end in mind. And so having the capacity to look at not just the end game for our high school students, we're able to take that and the, the end game and where we need them to be and back map that to pre-K and then build the continuity to say if we put these supports in earlier, we can eliminate in, in those achievement gaps that do exist. And so that is what we've been spending the bulk of our time on, is really bringing into the fold, not waiting for that college and career component when, and when you get to freshman year, but actually what does that look like for sixth grade students and even before that. And so one of the things that we recognize in our district where East Aurora High School is our sole high school, we have an extension campus, we have 
4,050 kids under one roof. We're the largest population under one roof in the state of Illinois. We are also a population that is uh, about 70% free and reduced, and we're a population that are black and brown students total probably about 94% in, in our district. And so with that, we have many of the challenges that come along with that. Um, but as we began to look at how students were achieving or why they perhaps weren't quite achieving at levels, we looked at things like language and making sure that our language programming was something that was going to be efficient. And so because we were looking at student performance on the test to be able to get in, you know, there are many of those kind of sort of things, hoops that they have to jump through to uh, earn that access at the collegiate level. And so one of the basic things was looking at reading and language acquisition. And so we built the dual language program, started that process three years ago, and next year we will have all of our children, not just our native Spanish-speaking children, but all of our children in East Aurora will be kindergarten through second grade dual language learners. And so that's huge for us. Uh, we know that the research and the data shows that one of the most effective ways to close the gap um, for students is to make them um, multilingual because that does something, making them biliterate. And so that is really big because not only is it benefiting our native speakers, but also our other students, our black students, to be able to graduate being fully biliterate is a total game changer and certainly makes them competitive on a national and international landscape. The second thing that I'd like to talk about is being proactive. So at the middle school and high school level, we have partnered with the College Board, which is one of the uh, most widely known and respected national outfits in terms of preparing students. But the wonderful thing about the College Board is that they have a whole division dedicated to equity and access. So the College Board is made up of many collegiate partners who partner with secondary and even middle school institutions to be able to say from the colleges themselves all across the country, this is what we're looking for. So we began our partnership. We were joined, applied, and were accepted two years ago. And so since then, we have increased the amount of students who are sitting in AP classes. We didn't take the fact that we had a low graduation rate and say, oh, let's continue to just focus on remediation. But one of the things that we did is said, no, let's partner with the best in the country and let's push our young people. And so we did just that. So we began to push larger numbers of students through being proactive and using the data to go out and get a kid who doesn't even realize how brilliant they are. We go out and, and grab them and say, did you know you were brilliant? And then we bring them into the fold and we place them in high, highly recognized classes. Um, and they have shown us that they are so resilient, they've done very well. In fact, this last year we've increased enrollment in AP to 1,462 courses, which equates to about 3,886 college credit hours earned in high school before they even leave our doors. Um, in doing that, people might say, well, if you push them into harder, more challenging experiences, then they're going to just fold, and they didn't. So we raised our graduation rate in four years from 69% to 81% this last year. You pushed them in the And so this is definitely an effort that you know, we could not do alone. And so we are so grateful for our partners. And so I'm going to look to my right as I finish and close out. And I think one of the major pieces of the rationale for the achievement gap, particularly that one that is uh, attributed to when you look at achievement gaps due to race and ethnicity, when you look at it due to socioeconomics, it, it's all about exposure. And so I am so grateful for our partner, Dr. Sobek. She's one of my favorite people, one of the first people I met when I came out to um, take this position. And as president of the college, uh, she's done wonderful, wonderful work in partnering with us in particular. And so I won't tell all the secrets because my <laughs> colleagues will be jealous. Um, but really, we have put kids into early college experiences. And as you spoke about that, I'm ever so grateful to Wabanzi that they've given our children that. When I met with her, I said, I need you to let all of my seniors in. She said, okay, no problem. We could, we could work that out. And we have been at this ever since. The pandemic slowed us down, but we have greatly increased our numbers in early college, exposing, exposing our children. And I want to tell one last brief story. Um, we designed a program for children who had historically dropped out. 
And so these are children who were getting to be, you know, 17 years old, but just out of shot of graduating, out of, you know, easy uh, range. And so we developed a program called EA Squared for those children to pull them out of traditional school, to allow them to remediate their credits through an online program, and then connect them directly to programs so that they're not just dropping out and just forever being without um, any credentials, even high school credentials. Through that, Wabanzi partnered with us, and through the Wabanzi Works program, they helped us to either get every single child at least a GED and enroll them for free in a career pathway to take coursework, or push them if they're close enough. And I want to just say thank you. You may not know this. We had 10 young people who were on the track to drop out that just this past January, Wabanzi enrolled them because they did catch up and remediate those credits through our partnership with the Urban League, and they are on your campus now, and it has been a huge game changer for them. So we're changing lives because they never saw themselves in college. So I want to say thank you for that because every child counts. So I'm very passionate, but I'm going to pause now to let us move on. Um, thank you. Thank you well. so you can see why just a couple of weeks ago, the Illinois Principals Association, the Kiss Rocky, Kiss Rocky Region, Named her superintendent of the year. <laughs> Dr. So proud of you. So we will be coming to your board meeting on your turf to recognize you appropriately from the mayor's office soon. So we appreciate you for making uh, history. And she mentioned the great president of Wabanzi Community College. Please give a round of applause, to Dr. Christine Sobeck. Thank you. I don't know what else I can say. Everybody's been tough picking on my thunder here. I'm embarrassed by all that uh, recognition. But thank you. Um, so um, I just have several additional things to add, though, and again, thank you to the mayor and everybody for having us here together. Um, so I'm president of Wabansi Community College, and if you're not familiar with us, we are a four-campus network. So we have our main campus in Sugar Grove, campus out in Plano, but also two campuses in Aurora, in the city of Aurora, our Aurora Fox Valley campus, you know, located near Rush Copley Medical Center, which is our healthcare campus, and then also right here in downtown Aurora. And I mentioned the Aurora downtown campus because our history is so deeply intertwined with Aurora. The, the founders of our college back in 1966, many of them were Aurora residents, and they saw the need for a community college in this area. So we have been downtown since 1986 in the old Carson Perry Scott and Stanley buildings, which are now transformed again. But I think the physical presence is an important public statement about the commitment to equity and access and success. Our current beautiful new Aurora downtown campus was eight years in the making and took a lot of resources and energy and enthusiasm to do it. But I think physical spaces, resources are all equally important as well as programs and services. So back in 2009, Wabansi was designated a Hispanic serving institution, which is very similar to what uh, President Scott was talking about. But um, we are proud of that designation, and it has allowed us to get three uh, federal grants. And our third grant we're in totals over $3 million, so we've been able to bring oh, more than $10 million in resources to this community to help our students of color. Our current grant, which we just launched a year ago, is allowing us to establish a Latinx Resource Center at our Aurora Downtown Campus. And the beauty of Title V grants is while they may be specifically focused on Latinx students, everything that happens, all the programs and services then benefit all of our students. We've been able to invest in professional development for employees around culturally relevant teaching opportunities. We have a well-known partnership with the Association for College and University Educators where our faculty can, re can receive a credential specifically in teaching in an inclusive manner. We are this year launching a transition program for our students in partnership specifically with six of our district high schools that builds on the successful upward bound programs that we have had at both East and Aurora High School for many years, East and West. What's unique about our upward bound programs is our staff are embedded in the high school. So they literally work there, they're there every day, so they become part of the team. And what I'm really excited about is we're launching a financial literacy program in partnership with the city's financial empowerment center because we know debt, finances, lack of awareness about budgeting, college resources, all of those things are a huge barrier for all of our communities. A couple of other things, we believe in dual credit and we've got more than 2,400 students enrolled this spring in dual credit throughout our district. We have a TRIO student support services program that we've had for probably three decades or more. 
that serves students and helps them succeed. I have to mention our Triumph program, and I have to get the acronym correct. It's Transforming and Impacting Undergraduate Men Pursuing Higher Education. This is a program specifically for men of color. Mayor Urban was there when we did the kickoff, as was Clayton. And we're very successful in having students experiencing mentoring and all kinds of other academic supports. And we have 25 active participants currently. And then we also know that in this technology world, we needed to provide additional resources to help students navigate. Because access to technology, we learned, is a huge barrier, and especially for many of our first generation low-income students. So we have created and supported academic coaches and something we call an online course navigator. So this is a person who is literally also enrolled in the online course, there to support and provide the technology support, not content. Doesn't take away from the faculty member who, of course, is a content expert. And this has really helped increase the success rates in our online courses. And I just have to end with one other thing. So I've noticed, you know, that the city's gotten a lot of attention this last week about recognizing Juneteenth as a holiday. Well, I have to tell you, we beat you to that. <laughs> but we didn't get all the publicity, so I did the publicity today. Because back at our December board meeting, our board of trustees approved Juneteenth as both an academic you know, calendar holiday as well as a holiday for employees. So we, too, will be celebrating <laughs> So with that, I'll conclude, and again, thank you everybody for the recognition, and thank you for the ability to be here today. Thank you, Dr. Sobek. Round of applause, Dr. Christine Sobek, 20 years. Thank you for everything. And it wraps us up with this section. I knew the time would catch up uh, with us quickly with this amazing group. The Superintendent of District 204, Dr. Adrian Tell. Thank you. I'll be as fast as possible. Uh, and I also want to say, because of the snowstorm, I'm able to be here. Because the other one, I couldn't be here because I was going to be at a conference in Springfield. So I'm glad that I could be as part of this discussion today. It's really a multi-layered approach that we have to go by in order to address these issues. We have to build capacity of our staff. We have to provide opportunities for our students. And we have to help all see uh, the relevance of the work that's being done. Our district, Indian Prairie, we came up with an equity statement. Uh, we're very proud of the fact that we have that statement. And it's a belief about eliminating barriers for our children and providing opportunities for all. With that said, though, an equity statement is just that. It's only a statement, and you have to have actions to go with it. And so from that standpoint, we have had various actions that we have in place to support our students. We have equity ambassadors throughout our district. We have a district equity leadership team, which provides the, the overall to re, of what we're doing with regards to equity in our school system. We also have affinity groups, because what we want to make sure of is that no one feels alone. And these affinity groups are for staff and for students, and they really help make a difference. What we have done with our students and our, our staff are as follows, in addition to what I've said before. We provide training on cultural bias and understanding how to build their capacity as staff. Every new teacher must take a course on understanding what cultural bias is. We also are helping staff in making their programs culturally relevant, looking very carefully at what types of books our, our students are using, and do they see themselves in those books. We are reducing our barriers to access to advanced level classes. We are also increasing access to advanced levels starting at the elementary level. I think Dr. Norell mentioned this earlier about the need to be looking at things earlier as opposed to later. Examining our curriculum for bias and ensuring that our students, as I said, see themselves and enhancing our staff to include more staff of color. Indian Prairie, I'm very pleased to say we have more staff of color than other school districts in the state of Illinois. And I'm very happy about that. But we could do more. We have a need for more uh, um, Hispanic staff, but we don't have them. And I know that it's a shrinking pool of, of, of teachers that are available that we can use, and we're trying to bring more into it. To help our students, we, give, we have different extracurricular activities, and we have some that are very much geared to our black and brown students. We have our Black Student Alliance, 
We have the Be Your Own, which is a partnership with the Girl Run and the World Aurora, offering coping skills and conflict resolution skills. We have a Muslim Student Association and an organization of Latin American students. All of that to help our students know that they belong, that they're with others who are like them, and that we care who they are and for their success. Everything that we do, though, we have to continue to review, revise, and expand even more. It is a never-ending task, but one that we take seriously. We know it makes a difference. We know it makes a difference because, as, as the president said, of the, what we have to make sure of is that we are creating opportunities so that students, when they leave here and go on to college, have better opportunities for their own emotional, financial, and physical well-being. And so I'm going to stop right there. I will pause back there. We prepared to close out. We are going to ask one final question for the panelists. But before we do that, an opportunity for uh, two questions or comments from the audience. If there's anyone that has any questions for the panelists or comments in general, we'll open it up to the audience first. So, um, do any of you outside of Chicago State University, do any of you have any Black American Studies programs or classes at your, at your facility? The question was for the camera outside of CSU, do any of you have any Black American Studies programs for your students? I can say at our high schools, um, they are doing, as part of their uh, English classes, they do uh, have work in that area, yes. I would echo that um, as well at East Aurora, and in, in fact, this year we uh, ask our Board of Education to approve additional studies, both for um, our English uh, series or sequence of courses, as well as our his history sequence of courses, building that into the curriculum um, for both our, for uh, Latin American courses in history, as well as African American courses in history, as well as literature. In the community college world, it's a little more challenging because we have something in Illinois called the Illinois Articulation Initiative, which defines transfer courses that students can take at the freshman and sophomore level to, to translate. So often the courses we have tried to offer, but they're electives and they don't transfer as general education requirements. So often we have not been successful in getting the enrollments that we would like to sustain those, especially during the COVID. Era. So we're looking at uh, both black studies, but also we had a pathway for Latinx students as well and uh, just have not been currently able to get the enrollments to sustain those. And again, part of it has to do with the transferability, which we continue to work on and do the Illinois Articulation Initiative. I think that Dr. Sovic said it really well. The other thing I will add is that uh, at, CODO we at COD, we try to do is inter interweave inter a component of that into some of our other courses, but um, is a is a distinct curriculum? No. At West Aurora, in our junior year, in addition to what my colleagues have said, it, in the English uh, American literature, when we think about what American literature is, uh, being really intentional about what those what those books, what those stories, what those topics are. We also offer um, African American literature as a senior elective, and then in our social studies department, we recently, an additional elective, um, historically underrepresented groups in U.S. history that teaches the history of that group as well, those groups as well. Thank you. Next question or comment? Once. I'm Felicia Bohannon. I'm the executive director of the Upper Bound Program at Northern Illinois University. I just want to say how much I appreciate this conversation. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of these issues we've discussed for a number of years, and just to hear the progress that's been made over a number of years and then being able to work with you all, I just want to say how much I appreciate this conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rich. And thanks for representing NIU, making your way out here. We appreciate you as well. As we conclude, I'm uh, just going to look at one facilitated question. We're going to talk to the group. If you don't mind, Clay, I'll, I'll, okay, ask, so. I'll ask that question before yeah. I ask. I want to say thanks for, for everyone participating in this very important conversation today. As I sit here with these very prestigious educators, presidents, and superintendents, and principals of schools, yeah, I, I, I I sit here as, you know, as the mayor of the city of Aurora, the first black mayor in you know, over 180 years, but this wasn't my beginning. You know, as, I, as I told you in the beginning, I, I had to beg my Spanish teacher in high school for a D 
instead of an F so I could walk my class. Because I'm not joking about that. <laughs> I actually had to do that, and I got that D minus. But my average grade was only about a C plus, a C minus, D plus anyway. Um, and let me tell you, I, I recognize growing up in uh, public housing, which, you know, and I know many folks out there, many folks watching on, you know, online here, it may be in similar circumstances where when I grew up in that environment, there was no real hope. You know, uh, there wasn't a hope for the future. Education wasn't, wasn't important. Just living day to day is, is what we focused on. You know, well, how are we going to put food on the table at the end of that, end of that week? You know, or, or get back and forth to the grocery store. You know, but as I got older, I recognized that I didn't want to become a product of my environment, that I needed to go to college but didn't realize how well I would do or if I'd do well at all. In fact, my goal was to get a C plus, B minus when I got to college. And, you know, something that, that, that a number of folks said, and Dr. Kelly wrapped it up there with folks uh, saying that, you know, you give a you know, kid an opportunity, you let them know you care about them. You know, I, I went to Robert Morris University, and I had my very first class that I took. It was a communications class. I had an African-American teacher, so it's, as you pointed out, uh, President Scott, it's very important to have folks that look like you, you know, and, and, and can relate to you and grow up in those circumstances. I got a B on my very first test that I ever took in college. I thought I was doing great. I was like, man, I was waving this bee around. I was about to go home, put it on my refrigerator. And then my, this, this teacher pulled me aside. Vern Sims was her name. She's African American. And she said, you know, Richard, a B is good. You know, matter of fact, I said, it was a B plus. I said, wait, B plus. You put that plus in there. She said, but that's not great. And she said, I think you can do better than that. You know, I, I believe in you. I believe in you is what she said. And, and, I, and I hear that as I... I hear all the educators talking, you know, around the state. But she said, I believe in you. So that very next, she says, I, I want you to get an A on the next test for me. So I studied hard, you know, worked hard, and I got an A on that next test. And I did it for her. I wanted to make her proud. And then I realized if I just applied myself, you know, and worked a little harder, I can get an A on any test. And I got an A on the test after that, the test after that, the test after that. And then I began to believe in myself. And that's what changed everything. Once I began to believe in myself, I realized, I can do anything if I just apply myself and work hard. Yeah, I decided I wanted to be a lawyer. I told my mom that. Yeah, she looked at me like I had a third eye in my head. You know, boy, we're from the hood. You know, we're not doctors and lawyers and such. I said, well, I'm going to be a lawyer. And I went to Northern Illinois University and got my law degree, passed the bar on the first try, and became a lawyer. This kid that grew up in low-income housing that had no hope, or most of the boys that I grew up with were selling drugs, on drugs, in jail, or even worse, succumbed to the violence that continued to escalate in, in my community. So all those folks listen, all the parents out there that might have kids struggling in high school recognize that there's hope. <laughs> if I can do it, I'm no better, I'm no smarter, I'm cut from the same cloth. Somebody believed in me and I began to believe in myself. So as these educators, these great educators around, around this table here show that they believe in our young people, our young people will definitely begin to believe in ourselves. They can achieve any goal. I just thought I'd say that. Thank you guys for everything you do because you make folks like me, you know, feel honored to sit at this table uh, with you, knowing that, that you make people like me exist every single day and every, you know, in, in all the work that you do. So thank you very much. I will follow Mayor Richard Irvin. I love particularly when he shares that with young people and just to watch their eyes light up, sometimes tears welling out and they see clearly the day can do it too. And as we prepare to wrap up, and we'll ask Dr. Scott to uh, be the final one to answer this question, but in a minute or less, what does true equity look like through an educational lens? And we'll begin with Dr. Talley and, and, and go around and conclude with uh, Dr. Scott. In my mind, through a true equity lens, nothing will be based upon race or ethnicity. Everything is open and available. Uh, Dr. Tavik, Indian Prairie School District 204. Dr. Sola. For me, equity is all students ha having access to the opportunities, resources, and supports that they need to achieve their educational goals. Thank you. Dr. Norell. My answer is a little different. I, I believe that true equity, as it relates to preparing students, must be intentional. We must intentionally look for how what we're doing and how we're doing it every day and keeping track of if we're meeting with success or if all students are meeting with success. So the intentionality of it is a must. 
think I mentioned a, a, a little bit earlier, just to embellish a bit. Um, for us, we look at specific su uh, success statistics and how uh, students of color are comparing to to white students, and and we do at College of DuPage have some uh, have some gaps. And what what equity means to us is providing the supports, all the supports, the holistic supports, um, all the things that have been discussed here, to try to help close some of those gaps and make students of color feel like they can be just as successful as anyone. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Martino. The work as educators is really to look at the opportunities and where those gaps are and secure those opportunities. So when students want those opportunities, it's our role to help them pursue that, whatever that might be. Thank you. President Scott. From my view, it's, it's really um, looking at things from where people are. The microphone. OK, I'll turn it on. Uh, <laughs> looking at things from where people are and, and not blaming the victim. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It is re removing that deficit language from how you think about people and understanding that poverty is not a crime mm -hmm. uh, and having more resources does not mean you can't succeed mm -hmm. and that really looking at people where they are. Thank you. Round of applause for all of our panelists and thank you so much for the presentation. Well, President Scott, we're going to ask the mayor to come down to the center with uh, President Scott. You can come on down. Let's give her a round of applause again, making her way out from the south side of Chicago. The work she's doing in Chicago is absolutely amazing. So it is my honor to give the Mayor's Award of Black Excellence to President Z. Scott of Chicago State University for raising the bar, setting new standards, and exemplifying excellence as you represent our culture, our community, and the collective goal empowering our youth. Surprise. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Mayor. <laughs> Thank you. We also have a presentation to President Scott from her sorority sisters of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority yes. Incorporated, the Glen Ellen Area yes. Alumni Chapter. Please make your way down. If you don't mind, we are so proud. Is it is it rude of us to be proud of our? <laughs> no, it's not. That was such an inspiring presentation, and it is the good work that you've been doing that makes us all so excited to be here to honor our own sorority sister, President Scott from Chicago State University. Thank you so much. Professor Scott in the middle, we can have ladies on both sides of it, please. Here, one more on this side. I want to get there. Perfect. There we go. Yes, we have to play first. Here, Monica. You good? More big round of applause for the ladies and We're going to ask the mayor and president Scott if all of our panelists can please join us in the center for a group photo. Big round of applause again for Dr. Brian Caputo, Dr. Whitney Martino, Dr. Jim Pinello, Dr. Jim Sorrell, and Dr. Jim Pinello. As we celebrate Black History Month here in Aurora, Roaring Black, our goal is to be intentional in everything that we do. And lastly, we'll ask Dr. Scott and the mayor to take a photo with our city council members. If our city council members can please come down. Again, we're being joined by Alderman Bain, Alderman Jenkins, and Alderman Donnell.